Kim Kardashian was at Harvard Business School a couple days ago, and I got an exclusive interview with one of the students that was in that class, yes, with Kim Kardashian, and he's gonna give us all the big secrets that Kim reveals about running, building her multi-billion dollar company. What she says on Instagram, I spoke at Harvard Business School yesterday for a class called HBS, that's Harvard Business School, moving beyond DTC, that's direct to consumer. The class's assignment was to learn about skims. So my partner, Jens, and I spoke about our marketing, our challenges, and the greatest wins. I am so proud of skims and the, and the thought that it is a course being studied at Harvard is just crazy. Thank you, Professor Len Schlesher and Harvard Business School for having us. Bucket list dream. Whoa, this is a big deal. Um, this is a big deal for Harvard. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sure all the students were going crazy over it, but this is a bigger deal for Kim Kardashian to align her brand with Harvard University. So today we have Justice Tension from Harvard Business School, and he's going to give us the lowdown on everything that Kim said in that course. Tell me who you are. Tell me, you know, tell me about like what you're studying at Harvard and all of that. Yeah, uh, my name is Justice. I am a first year MBA student at Harvard Business School, um, getting my master's um, and uh, really interested in consumer technology. So thinking about kind of the technology and the products that we use every day um, and studying here to learn more about what's next. So Kim Kardashian, you know, was in, you know, she taught at a class and you were in that class. So tell me, what was that class like? And what was that experience like uh, meeting her? Yeah, so the class was called Moving Beyond DTC, and it's thinking about direct-to-consumer or DTC brands um, and kind of what's the future of them. Um, so this is the fourth year the class has been taught. In the first year, DTC brands are really popular. There was a lot of them. They are pretty easy to start. Um, right now, we're in sort of a very different space. Um, it's really hard for a lot of brands to find customers. And so what we've seen increasingly is a trend towards celebrities leveraging their own star power um, and their own personal brands to launch businesses. Um, it's one of the most efficient way to acquire customers is using the platform that Celebrity offers. And we brought in several examples, but the biggest example of this was Kim Kardashian and her brand Skims. Um, so uh, she came and spoke with her co-founder, Jens, um, who is Swedish and is very successful, uh, launched a couple of other brands as well. Um, and they kind of talked about their journey in launching Skims and kind of where they see it going from there. Uh, I just, just to ask a question, you mentioned how it, it's difficult right now for um uh, or businesses to sell products why why is that yeah so you've seen a trend in the past few years um where uh before it used to be really easy to find new customers basically via facebook ads like that was the gist of it is you could go on instagram and we probably all remember seeing tons of different instagram ads um and it was really really cost efficient for businesses to do so and so what you could do is you could say i want to start you know whatever it is a skincare brand um, a sunglass brand, and I'm going to bypass going through wholesale retailers. I'm going to put ads directly on Instagram, and I'll just basically print money that way. Um, Instagram ads have gotten way more expensive. There's a few reasons for that. One is traditional uh, brands that started using Instagram ads that have driven up the price. The second is that um, some recent changes from Apple have made it a lot more difficult to target customers. So as a result, it's pretty expensive um, now. Oh, Oh, you mean like specifically when they ask you to not to track, when you can ask the app not to track your phone, okay. That has made it much more expensive for brands to try to find really good customers. Um, so as a result, um, it's more difficult to kind of make these ads uh, at efficient enough price. Um, so what we've seen is celebrities who already have enormous platforms, um, they just use their own platform. So instead of paying for ads, they're just using their, you know, in Kim's case, 300 million followers to promote their brand. Yeah, so I actually talk about that a lot about like sort of influencers uh, building businesses from Kanye to actually probably Jay-Z and Diddy were the first to do it. And then it, it expanded in that way. So uh, what are what are, what are some of the main takeaways that you got from Kim Kardashian? Uh, first of all, what was it like having Kim in the classroom? That's the first question. Uh, I mean, it was pretty crazy. I mean, I think they were joking that like this is more security they have um, than when like a president comes to campus. Um, it was pretty elaborate. Uh, she was also filming her show. So she filmed um, 
part of the Kardashians, which is on Hulu. Um, when they like entered the building, when they got on campus, it was clearly very exciting for her. They weren't allowed to film inside of the classroom. So the classroom is treated as like a sacred space. Um, so, so wait, how big was the team that came? Like how many people? Like 20, 20 people. Okay. Um, camera people, um, like hair, makeup people, um, her just general entourage. I don't know everyone. Um, and then, uh, Yes, yeah, so if she comes in the room, whole room goes silent. She looks, uh, I mean, you can see the photos of what she was wearing, like this black, like pinstripe suit um, with like these black gloves. So, you know, it was clearly like sort of quite over the top. Um, and uh, we kind of ran classes if she was any other guest. So the first 15 minutes or so is the professor leading a discussion with the students basically about the subject who's visiting, um, but without that subject participating. So we're just talking about Kim and about her brand while she's in the room listening in, um, but without her being allowed to engage. And then the next 15, 20 minutes or so was a Q and A between um, the professor and uh, Kim Kardashian, her co-founder, Jens. Uh, and then we had about 45 minutes to an hour of open Q and A between the students and her. So what was that like? What were some of like what are some of the most important lessons that you feel that she sort of gave you guys in that class? Yeah, I think what was really interesting is that um, uh, she's very self-aware. So I, I think self-awareness is a recurring theme amongst all the speakers we talked to is one of the most powerful traits of any entrepreneur. Um, and so when you think about her and what she's doing, you know, she's very aware that like there are lots of celebrities that just throw their name onto a product. Um, and just use that to try to make a quick buck. Um, she had a very different approach. So she really wanted to focus on shapewear largely because it was a pretty untapped market or like Spanx was kind of the existing um, entrant, which was much older. And so she knew that like there was an opportunity for not just her to have influence, but for like this product to actually be very good. So um, her and her co-founder were just super emphatic that the most important thing um, for them is the product. It's not Kim's brand. Um, like, yes, that's like a superpower that like allows them to have distribution at a really grand scale. But ultimately, the most important thing is that the product has to be really, really good. Um, and so, you know, she talked about kind of identifying what were the needs that she had and but then also working with friends. Um, and then another really interesting point that I think. Sorry, what you said, what, what were the needs she had? Like, what do you mean by that? For finding shapewear that like suited her body and that matched her skin tone but her body doesn't her body doesn't represent like most women so how did that apply totally and i, I think it was about uh, for her being inclusive and understanding like i can't find shaper that fits for me but like also there's many other types of people out there and so um and then that kind of leads to the, the second kind of big takeaway which was like think she they were both very cognizant of how do we build a brand that's bigger than kim um, and so what that meant is like, like you said, like Kim is a very specific look and uh, like the way that her co-founder thinks about it is like her aesthetic is very aspirational or is like, it is at least very distinctive and lots of people like look at it. It's very iconic in its own right. That being said, it is not a universal aesthetic by any means. And so it was about bringing in other people who have um, like sort of their own distinct looks and, and shapes. And so um, it was really interesting. Like, I think the way that Kim thinks about who she wanted to incorporate in promoting the brand was quite, um, uh, I would say self-aware and that she was thinking about like athletes and that's why they went out and did the Olympic partnership. So um, like getting athletes involved. Um, she thought a lot about like when we asked, you know, who are some people you want to have uh, be representatives of Skims? Um, she mentioned like Oprah Winfrey and Martha Stewart, which is like not at all who I would kind of go to as sort of who are the contemporaries of Kim Kardashian. Uh, but it makes a ton of sense if you think about like how to grow this brand. So, um, so that was sort of in her that was in her vision board of the Oprah Winfrey's, and that has translated because I think about her current sort of like um, influencer campaigns and and celebrity campaigns that she does very. Uh, I think they're they they have this very everyday kind of people, you know, influence, and I think Oprah maybe represented that in her time. So is that what like you mean by she had Oprah in her? Yeah, vision I think board? she's yeah, just like as she thinks about who do I want to expand and like continue to be like again, like she's like this brand can't just be me. Like if this brand is just me, it'll it'll fade over time. But if this brand is um, 
you know, inclusive of uh, Victoria's Secret models from 20 years ago, Victoria's Secret angels from 20 years ago, uh, if it's inclusive of like the latest and greatest of like pop stars, like it's just this amalgamation of like people who start to build a brand that far transcends like one individual. So, so what do you think it is about that? Because that's kind of the same theme that Rihanna did with her makeup line, like reaching a wide, like when with her makeup, she has colors for literally every skin tone. And it's almost like because of their reach as a as a celebrity being so expansive, do you think that kind of played into both of them deciding that they're going to reach so many people? Yeah, I mean, I think the inclusivity is like very um, like important. And when we think about like the new age of brands, like I think there's a reason that Victoria's Secret has like struggled um, in their like attempt to kind of pivot out from like this Victoria's Secret angel model um but i think like brands like savage fenty and uh uh everything from um like skims um to parade have like had much more inclusive in terms of like you know body shapes body colors like kind of everything like the whole the whole gamut i think inclusivity is like a very important part of like just the new age brand um but i also think the common theme amongst both of those is like both of those brands i think are bigger than their celebrities mm -hmm. Kim's with kim kardashian obviously Rihanna as well. We talked a little bit about her, but I think some other ones that are quite big is um, like Savage, uh, not sorry, um, Casamigos and George Clooney. I think that brand has transcended George Clooney. It's much bigger than just him now, even though it's, it is Absolutely. his brand. Um, Absolutely. Another one that's a good example. I think the Jordan brand honestly transcends Michael Jordan at this point. Um, like I think you know, Jordan is seen as like an icon, but I think the brand itself is also an icon itself. And so we talked a little bit about that. And like, there's a reason um, that that does so well over time. And other artists want to all attach their names and other brands want to attach their name to the Jordan brand. Um, and then the last one that, that her co-founder also brought up that I thought was also one that I hadn't thought about, it was Travis Scott has like a really distinct aesthetic. Um, and like, there's a reason that Travis Scott can attack, like attach Cactus Jack to like a, a Burger King burger and it can sell really, really well. Before we get into uh, Travis Scott, I want to like touch on Kim Kardashian. These brands that these guys are picking are specifically like thing products that people need in the world. Like everyone needs to wear shoes. Everyone needs to wear, well, you want, you need to wear underwear basically, or, or with um, Rihanna, everybody, women need, feel they need to wear makeup, right? So these are like essential products. So do you feel like it, do you think it's the necessity that makes it, um, it or do you think that's part of the foundation that they're using to build that icon, iconic brand by first tapping into what we need and then expanding through other ways of, of, of I branding, think in all the products that we, I just mentioned, all of them, like the products stand alone well. So uh, what I mean by that is like uh, there are businesses, right, where like I can go to a skincare company say i want to start my own skincare line they will give me a product that already exists and then they'll allow me to like put my own brand over it i think none of them are doing this right like all of them have innovative products where like the product itself is like fundamentally stands alone is innovative in itself whether it's tequila whether it's skincare whether it's intimates um whatever it may be all of these are like products that are quite expensive and new to make so did Kim explain the steps that it took for her to actually implement that iconic uh, like branding? Like the product innovation? Not specifically the innovation, but the branding of how... Because I know she said product was important, right? But you said she, she it was a priority to her to make sure the product is iconic and, and separate from her, but still kind of works together with her. What did she explain what steps it takes? Yeah, to actually I mean, I think part that. of it was one, like the naming itself, like it has Kim in it, but it's not like Kim's intimates, right? Like, like that, that was one. That's so crazy. I never saw that. It had, I've never, I just saw that. I, mean, I, know, I didn't that it, it has her name in it. <laughs> wow. That's like her literally Kim's. Right. Okay. It, got it's it. not <laughs> called Kim's intimates. It's called skims. Um, wow. The second was from the get go, wow. just in court, ensuring that she was not the only celebrity featured. So I think they had Kate Moss pretty immediately featured. I, I I can't remember all the names. So this is almost like, I'm just like breaking down what you're saying. This is psychological. Like it, the fact that like, you know, it's taken these many years and even both of us before she, you pointed this out, we didn't even realize that her name is in the brand. That's psychologically sort of like driving you to support Kim. Then you mentioned Kate Moss. She's attaching like one of the most iconic models, bringing it on the level of Victoria's Secret psychologically. 
but then also including so many other sort of people as well. Yep, exactly. So I think that's been very powerful. I think Rihanna did the same thing. Like, I, I think Rihanna's done like quite a good job from the get go of incorporating celebrities far beyond herself that like pull in other people. So it's not just like they're only the Rihanna show. Right. Um, book a one on one, book a one on one, yeah. Book a one on one, book a one on one, yeah. Book a one on one, book a one on one, yeah. With me, with me, ooh, we, ooh, we, yeah. Book a one on one, book a one on one, yeah. Book a one on one call with me. Let's talk about content marketing for your brand. How to use content marketing to increase your sales, just like I'm doing right now. Book a one on one, book a one on one. So, content marketing, I'm gonna teach you content marketing for your business to increase your sales. Or we can book a call giving you strategy on music and entertainment, the business of music and entertainment. Book a call with me, book a one-on-one, -on -one, book a one-on-one, -on -one, link down below. You were saying Kate Moss and then what else were the steps to get that iconic um, branding? You, you know, I think they have, so, so I think first, right, the emphasis was like on getting the product right. But then as you think about like the steps they've done since they did, um, they were like an official partner with um, the underwear for the Olympic athletes. Um, that is an incredible feat of achievement from a partnership perspective, right? Like, okay, why is that? Um, it is just not easy to become like an official sponsor of the Olympics, right? Like, it's like uh, Polo Ralph Lauren, I think, is one of the big ones, and like these are huge brands that we're talking about. That are but I guess my question with the Olympics is, what does that mean for her brand? Is that about awareness? Because I think, okay, World Cup, I think that is like a billion viewers. When I think Olympics, maybe like, sorry, World Cup is four billion viewers. Olympics maybe one billion, right? But is it is it about awareness or what is it about with the Olympics? Well, I, you know, this, I'm just speaking on personal experience, right? So I, I used to live in LA and I was like um, right off Sunset in West Hollywood. And I remember like there's these huge um, hotels and they'll put like these giant ads up on the side of the hotels and they'll have everyone for like Zendaya will be up there. But for a while it was um, like some Olympic skiers and they were wearing skims and it was Team USA, right? So I think it, it does two things. One, oh. it shows like here is like, Team USA, right? Like, so if we're thinking about the biggest market they have, which is the American market, you're attaching like what is a very physical um, event and activity, and it's like very much about body, right? Like, it's just it's about body, and you're attaching your brand to um, not just aesthetics but performance, um, and you're saying like athletes are choosing to wear this product, um, and I, I think that was like. I, I mean, to me, right, like, I'm not personally buying women's apparel, but like, I was like, oh, this must be like a quite a hefty product if this is like actually something that like a world class level athlete is using on their own. Um, and so I think that is like, again, if you're thinking about, I don't think of Kim Kardashian as like as any sort of like, yes, she's a very aesthetic person, but she's not an athlete. Right. To go out and then to get like a huge crop of athletes that have the world's attention on them. And they say that this is not just for looks, but this is also for performance, I think is indicative not only of like the product quality, but mm, is also, mm. uh, you know, it, it does more to expand what the brand is um, capable of representing. Okay. That, that's, that's very interesting. So are there any other steps that um, like went into making it iconic? Um, you know, I think what I would say is, I wouldn't necessarily call this an iconic brand yet. I think it has the absolute makings and potential. Um, I, when I think about the greatest risk for the brand, I think it's just the durability of it. Like um, if Skims is still around in 10 years, um, I think that's what's going to be like the real test of time. Right now, the brand is valued at about twice that of Calvin Klein. Um, Wait, it's, it's valued at twice the price of Calvin Klein? Is that what you just said? Like the brand as a whole is valued at 3.2 billion. Calvin Klein's valued at about 1.5 billion. Huh. Okay. So keep, keeping that in mind, why would they, why would you then say that it's not iconic? Um, what I would say is, uh, I think a large part of that valuation is contingent on the growth potential, right? So I think with Calvin Klein, it's been around for so long that we don't expect it to grow like exponentially in like the next few years. I think with Skims, what there's kind of an anticipation for is that this brand will continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and that they'll be able to successfully expand into swimwear, into potentially men's, into sportswear, um, probably get even like in-person retail locations. And so the brand's been around for like five years. Um, I think it's doing incredibly well, but I think it has like a few hurdles and her co-founder mentioned this is like, there's kind of just these general hurdles that, like every brand has to overcome, but what does it look like 
for skims to be the size of Victoria's Secret, for skims to be the size of Lululemon, where it is like a classic standalone brand that we are confident will endure for another 10 years. Um, I, I think it fully has all the makings of, to do so, but I still think they have to execute on like some big steps coming up. So what are those hurdles? What are those hurdles that they broke down for you in the, in the class? Yeah, I think one of them is uh, continuing to expand into additional lines and which lines do you choose, right? So, okay, you're doing shapewear and intimates right now. Um, swimwear is like a pretty natural next step. Um, but does it also make sense to expand into um, like athleisure? Does it make sense to expand into men's? And choosing these wisely, I think is really important, right? Like making sure that you have that sequencing right, where like the next jump you make is not one that's like a blip, but it's like something that can be equally, if not more successful. Um, so if I think about Lululemon, for example, one of the things that makes Lululemon as massive as it is today is that they were so able to successfully expand into menswear. That's just like okay. a huge okay. achievement of what that brand was able to do. Um, and so for Skims is like, choosing those next things right will be really important. Um, and then similarly, I think right now they're largely online. They have also a strong retail presence, but if they can successfully translate their brand into physical in-store locations, that will just unearth like a huge new set of opportunities for the brand as well. But people are saying that um, physical stores or uh, brick and mortar stores are like becoming obsolete because of the internet. What What is your take on that? I don't think so. I mean, I think like, like the internet is, I, I think any successful brand that wants to achieve truly massive scale has to do everything. Like, I, I don't think you can be the next Nike or you can be the next Lululemon only online. Um, likewise, I don't think Nike or Lululemon can only be in person. They all need to have presence in all locations. Um, and they also, they help each other. Right. So we've heard from numerous occasions where like, um, and this wasn't in Kim's, uh, talk, but from other talks in the same class, um, if you were another brand and you opened a store in Boston, you were largely online. When you open that store in Boston, yes, you start selling out of that store, but you also start selling more online in the Boston area from people who come and visit the store and then go home and buy online. So is that, is the store, cause before I feel like a store was more sort of like utility, like you needed it, but it seems like it's now becoming about experience or experiential marketing or so like can you speak to that yeah i think it's experiential marketing i think it's an opportunity for people especially depending on the type of product like these very touch and feel products like you know if you're selling bedding or if you're selling like something where the material is very important you need to be able to touch it it's like being able to offer that in-person experience i think will really help translate into meaningful sales um i think the second thing too is like it's another way to build your brand presence um and so when we're talking about building an iconic brand um like I, I think everybody knows what a Victoria's Secret looks like in a mall, right? Like, you know, and you know what it looks like, or Sephora, right? Like, these are all places that have a very distinct brand, n not just image online, but they also have like a very distinct, like physical presence. Um, and I think that also helps guide what you're able to expand into more, right? Like you're coming in and you're looking for one thing and you might discover something else. Um, and like, all of that is another way to kind of continue to grow and build your brand. I, I totally understand. So what else did you learn from, from that class? Um, I think there is, you know, a bit, it, it's a challenging time to be building a consumer brand, frankly. I think um, just the combination of like, you know, it's, it's a difficult economy, but also specifically with like this advertising has made it really challenging. It was um, really interesting just to think about what does it take to, um, build a successful brand today. And I think the two major takeaways is one, the power of celebrities, um, just celebrities and influencers who already have their own platforms. And so you aren't using paid ads, you're using actual people or influencers um, to promote your product is really, really powerful. And then the second one is that more than ever, product matters a lot. You have to have like a very distinctive product. In the past, I think you could offer like a very similar product but just because you put it online, you're able to undercut price. Um, you can't do that anymore. And so you have to create a product that's somehow fundamentally different and better. And those who are able to do so right now and are able to combine that with like a celebrity or some sort of interesting arbitrage and means of distribution are able are the ones that are able to succeed right now. Did she give you any sort of insight in her product development process, like defining what the market needed uh, and creating it? Yeah, I think for her, it was really about like, I, I, you know, she talked a little bit about just like 
for her, it's about reaching out to her like friends and like what she mentioned a little bit, which was an interesting example is like, um, I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but I think ribbed cotton is like a material that she personally is not a big fan of, but a lot of her friends were just continuously like, I love this material. Wait, who's not a fan of ribbed cotton? She is not? Kim. Yeah. yeah. Okay. She's like, that wasn't her personal favorite material, but a lot of her friends and her customers loved it. And so for her, it was about like, you can't just make this about me, right? Like it's about what my customers and what my friends and what people yeah. need. Um, and so that's like, she's like, we got to keep making it. And so she made sure that that was something that like was incorporated and um, evolved into. So it was about balancing like her own needs, but also like what the needs of like sending her friends stuff. And she'll talk about how like, yeah, like her friends will say like, I really need something that looks like this. And they'll send like a picture and then they'll like make a mock-up, they'll send them a sample and like they'll ask for feedback. Um, but it's literally like a lot of people that she knows just like texting her, um, talking about like, I have this need, I, I need this specific type of garment. Um, and she now has the machine to come up with like what that product can look like. So it's actually, that that's something that Jeff Bezos says also, uh, um, customer centricity. Um, you know, like going, I feel like that's his whole motto, you know, and he does it in a way that other brands just don't even come close to. Um, so oh, I forgot you said something and I, I lost my train of thought, but okay. We were talking about, um, developing her product. So are there any other sort of like key components or into like, actually like launching each product or like what else? Cause like learning from a billionaire business, I guess you learn from so many businesses that are probably just as as rich but a lot of us don't get to hear insight from kim kardashian so this is like really big information for any entrepreneur yeah i mean i think the other interesting thing um and right, i come from more of a software background so this is much more new for me is um when you're selling physical goods your supply chain and your inventory management is really important so they operate very much off of a drop model instead of like a seasons model um but you know what she admits and what her co-founder both say is like, you know, there's some cachet to exclusivity and like making something feel exclusive and like that drives a lot of hype. That being said, two million people be on a wait list for a product that just pisses people off. So like you need to get really good at like, how do we manage inventory? And like, how do we not have too much of a product, but also like it's not helpful when a million people want to buy something and we don't have either the capabilities or the inventory or the knowledge of like how much the demand's going to be in order to meet that full supply. Um, so you you talked about the drop model. And I, I mean, I, I guess when Rihanna started doing partnerships with like Puma uh, and stuff, she was doing that. Kylie Jenner, that's how she launched um, her lipstick line. So I can see how she took that model as um, based on her influence and her and all of that. But like, how does she sort of like decide, okay, we need to get, how does she decide the numbers that she needs to you know, get to be able to put to the market and say, okay, let's drop this. Did she uh, break any of that down? No, she wasn't able to break that down. I mean, what I would say though, just about the drop model is like, it's a great way for, you're basically like creating hype and then you're also kind of constraining your supply. So you're not gonna end up with just like a bunch of inventory sitting around. I mean, he did say like inventory sitting around is extremely expensive. So the drop model is a good way to basically prevent like that being an issue. What you don't want to run into though is like, you know, we're going to say, oh, we're going to do 100,000 of like the special supply. Um, and then you have like 2 million people show up trying to buy it. Like mm. th th at that point, you've just like totally miscalculated how big that drop should be. And it's like, no, you don't have any excess inventory, but you have a bunch of pissed off customers. But how does she, how does she figure out how to, you know? I think that's an art, like an art, not, or well, actually, I know, I think that is a science, but I think that's something that they're getting better with over time. Um, but like, I think it, rem I, I think it, again, like that's another big challenge for the business. So do you think, do you see the drop model becoming more popular? Because like at the same time I see it can work, but if you're always dropping something exclusive every month, I feel like it doesn't have the same kind of like impact. I think it can work when you're starting a business. I do not think that a successful like $10 billion brand can operate off a drop model. Um, and I think, um, I think a co-founder alluded a little bit to this. He's like, when you go into Lululemon, you can expect to find some of the same basics constantly. Like you will always be able to go in and expect to find the same leggings or the same colors always. And Skims needs to 
operate the same way where like there's a few staple items that you can always expect to find and like that is different than the drop model um it's it's more expensive it's much larger scale um but i think that is what you have to get to if you want the brand to like endure over time otherwise you're gonna be like a small boutique like fashion house brand, right? Like you're going to look much more like a Dior. You're not going to look like an everyday Nike or Lululemon. Right. That's really great. So is there anything else um, that you got from this um, from this talk? I mean, it was 45 minutes long, but what else is, is very impactful? I mean, I think my main takeaway is she is a very smart businesswoman. Like, I think regardless of what people think, she clearly knows her stuff. I think she thinks a lot about um, overexposure. Um, I think she's very selective about what she wants to participate in and what she doesn't want to participate in at this point. Like, um, she talked a little bit about when she was younger and earlier in her career, they would sign brand deals with Sears. Um, and it was like the Kardashian Sears collection and they would come up and show her the clothes. And she's like, I kind of like this one. I kind of like, don't like that one. And it didn't matter because all of them were put on the sales rack. And she just said like, when you're young and you're hustling, you are going to have to do work with people you don't want to do. Um, but the trade-off is, is that as you get bigger and as you get more influence in your career, you should be a lot more selective in who you want to do business with and how you want to shape your own brand. And I think she's done really, really good at that. And I also think that's actually an incredibly transferable lesson to like kind of anybody who wants to be successful in business. So I have two questions about those sort of like uh, partnerships because there comes a point when influencer businesses well she okay she said that she's made her business iconic but at the end of the day it's still kim's line and if kim for some reason or any other celebrity logan paul gets canceled for something obnoxious that they've done it affects the brand right so does she does she explain how that is a challenge that she has navigated and even like the balenciaga situation did that affect skims did that affect her branding and how does that even translate? Or even Kanye, too. Well, yeah, I mean, I think she talked a little bit about it. But w one thing I would just point out, which is probably just sort of unique to Kim Kardashian, like, she's no stranger to scandal. I think she's really good at dealing with it at this point, right? Like, she has plenty of family members who, like, end up in the news. And so, like, when it comes to brand durability, um, if I just think about celebrities, I think there's like probably few who've gone through more and are still extremely resilient than like the Kim Kardashian brand. Like there's, there's so much happening around her at all times. Um, and so when I think about risks to the business, I don't know, I think she's like a fairly resilient celebrity and like, uh, I, I think it would be compared to like other celebrities, like, you know, might have like really pristine reputations or something and like have never been involved in scandal. And like, then it feels like it could be like much greater risk um, to like their reputations and like therefore their brand's reputation over time. With Kim, I just feel like she's gone through so much already that like w what more is going to truly phase. Okay, so what did she say about it? Because I'm, I'm curious to know for, for the person that is not Kim that's watching this and it's kind of like, I you know, maybe they don't want to go into uh, an influencer partnership with their brand or their business. What What is their thought process about that? I think one example, which was very tangible, is when the brand originally launched, it was going to be called Kimono. Um, and that was seen as quite insensitive. And so it got a lot of backlash. And so she did talk about that. She said first, so it was a big wake-up call. She was like, I had to look around the room and be like, how do we all miss this? She's like, I, I don't understand. So she's like, that was a big wake-up call for just like the team. And for her to be like, this is a big wake-up call. The second thing she said is like, there were going to be a set of people that every time a product was released, they would be upset. And she's like, let's just change it. So... I, I think that is like pretty reactive. She said, let's just change it. Or what she said, let's just what? So the brand was renamed from Kimono okay, to Skims. Okay. All right, right. Yeah, I got that. I got that. So um, they, uh, you know, it was expensive because they originally, I think they printed out like the label on everything. So like every garment like was printed with Kimono. So they had to go back and add tags um, and put it over all the initial product releases. And she was like, it was annoying because like, you know, I wanted everything to be perfect. And part of it being perfect was that it was going to have printed tags. And now I had, or I had printed out like the labels and I had to have tags on them. She's like, but that was a trade-off and like nothing's perfect. And, you know, you learn to live with it. And that was the first drop. And now, you know, it was, it was for the better. So, you know, I think she's adaptive. I do think that being able to parse out haters versus like 
a valid criticism is is useful. So there you have it. That is everything that Kim talked about in that class. What are your thoughts? Did you learn any from any? Did you learn anything from this? Leave a comment down below. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, all the above. You're watching Brand Video Pro, and I'm your host, Ken Amo, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.